Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the SAMHSA Gain Center webinar on medication-assisted treatment and drug courts, addressing barriers to effective implementation. We have an excellent lineup today, and um, I have a few housekeeping things to take care of before we start with our presentations. My name is Lisa Callahan. I work at Policy Research Associates in the SAMHSA Gain Center, and I'll be uh, moderating the panel today. And um, I. I'm going to read this disclaimer. The views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation and discussion do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for Mental Health Services, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Just a couple of reminders. You'll have the opportunity to submit questions and answers. Um, and you'll see on the right-hand uh, side of this slide the place to do that, um, the Q&A, and we will also be doing polling. So when you're prompted, if you would please respond to the polls when they are opened, and we'll be sharing those once the poll closes. It gives us an idea of who is on the webinar, so we um, have a sense of the breadth of the uh, reach for these webinars. So please respond to the polls I think they're open now. You'll see them in the lower right-hand corner of your, of your um, computer screen. So the, rep, the webinar will be recorded and um, the slides will be disseminated in the days following the webinar. At the end of the webinar, there will be a certificate of attendance that's available for download, but this does not um, allow, this does not provide CEU credits, but instead it's for your own personal portfolio. This is the agenda for today's webinar. Um, I, as soon as I'm done with introducing um, the, this, this agenda, I'll turn it over to John Berg. And I just wanted to give you a sense of the overview and the three, three presenters are D Doug Marlowe, Steve Hansen, and Sean Flurkey. I'll introduce them more formally um, after we hear from John Berg. So John Berg is a Senior Public Health Advisor with the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment at SAMHSA, and he's going to give some opening remarks. Thank you so much, Dr. Callahan. And welcome to today's webinar, Medication-Assisted Treatment in Drug Courts, Addressing Barriers to Effective Implementation. We appreciate you taking the time to participate in today's informative webinar. SAMHSA is interested in promoting policies and practices to lower the risk of overdose for persons with opioid use disorder who are or have been in contact with the criminal justice system. There is overwhelming evidence that medication-assisted treatment is an effective intervention for addressing opioid use disorders in criminal justice populations. Research indicates current high rates of opioid use disorder among drug court participants nationally, but there are gaps in the availability of medication-assisted treatment in many drug court programs. In this year's Adult Treatment Drug Court Funding Opportunity Announcement, SAMHSA is requiring drug courts to implement medication-assisted treatment with access to FDA-approved medications. Therefore, if drug courts are interested in future SAMHSA funding, this webinar will be very helpful with effective implementation of MAT. Today, you will hear three perspectives on common implementation barriers experienced by drug courts transitioning to offer MAT and how these barriers can be addressed. Themes of funding, stigma, education, training, and partnerships will be discussed. SAMHSA released an evidence-based resource guide in 2019 titled Use of Medication-Assisted Treatment for Opioid Use Disorder in Criminal Justice Settings. This guide focuses on using medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder in jails and prisons and during the reentry process when justice-involved persons return to the community. It provides an overview of policies and evidence-based practices that reduce the risk of overdose and relapse. This document is provided today as a resource and can be found on the SAMHSA website. We are excited to host today's webinar as we have three experts in the criminal justice field uh, present. Dr. Douglas Marlowe, who was a lead writer and contributor on the expert panel for the recently released SAMHSA document noted earlier. Steve Hansen and Sean Flurkey. I would also like to thank the Gaines Center and their staff for their work in developing and facilitating today's webinar. At this time, I will turn it back to Dr. Callahan. Thank you, John. Um, I'm gonna, um, the first presenter, I wanted to just give a brief overview as you see his just a few bullets about his professional um, world here. 
So Dr. Uh, Dr. Doug Marlow will be the first presenter. He, many of you are probably familiar with uh, Dr. Marlow's work through the National Association of Drug Court Professionals and NDCI. Um, he is the, formerly the uh, Chief of Science, Law, and Policy for NADCP, the Director of Law and Ethics and Research at the Triangle uh, Treatment Research Institute, and he's also an Adjunct Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania's School of Medicine. The second speaker is Mr. Steve Hansen. Uh, Mr. Hansen is the Associate Commissioner for Courts and Criminal Justice uh, for the New York State Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services. He was previously the Associate Commissioner for Treatment in New York State, and he over, um, overseeing treatment services, including oversight of, to, of the 12 state-operated inpatient treatment programs. The third speaker is Judge Sean Flurkey. He is a district court judge in the 6th Judicial District of Minnesota. He also uh, founded and presides over the DWI court in his area, and it, which is also one of the four National Center for DWI Courts Academy Courts in the nation. So we'll, we'll begin with our first speaker, and no, I'm supposed to give you the poll results. So um, in, in response to the poll, polling that um, you all responded to, thank you very much for participating. We have a very, um, very good distribution of participants. The largest percentage is from um, individuals from rural areas, followed closely by urban areas. It's about a third and a third. We also have, um, in looking at the professional associate affiliations of the participants on the webinar today, there are about 20% from the judiciary and 20% from probation and parole. And um, also a number of people who registered as being from government or community-based service providers. Thank you very much for providing that information. And I'll turn it over to doc, uh, Dr. Doug Marlowe now for his presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for attending this uh, webinar. Uh, we've been asked to focus on resolving barriers to the use of medication-assisted treatment in drug courts. Um, I just want to start by saying that medication-assisted treatment really is the officially recognized standard of care. Uh, medications in uh, collaboration with uh, psychosocial counseling, social services, is the standard of care according to the organizations you see on your screen, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, NIDA, Surgeon General, and the like, up to and including the National Association of Drug Corps Professionals. These are not the only organizations that are in favor of it, but basically I think the point's been made and we pretty much ran out of room on our screen. <coughs> Research establishes that medication-assisted treatment improves outcomes in the justice system. Uh, green, uh, uh, green checks indicate that it has been proven to work in the criminal justice system in randomized controlled trials. Yellow or orange uh, uh, checks mean that it is very promising in justice settings. And as you can see, the main purpose of medication-assisted treatment is to enhance treatment entry and reduce opioid use, and these medications are pretty much all demonstrably effective. Less clear what effects it has on criminal recidivism, but the, the purpose of the medications is not to reduce crime, it's to rehabilitate people with the longer-term effects of reducing crime. NADCP's best practice standards place an affirmative obligation on drug courts to learn the facts about MAT. Ignorance about MAT is not acceptable and itself violates best practice standards. Drug courts are expected to seek and, if possible, obtain medical consultation. Blanket prohibitions against medication-assisted treatment as a condition of entering a program or graduating from the program are prohibited. By best practice standards, drug courts are expected to make a particularized factual inquiry in each case, not just saying our policy is yes or no, but based on the particular facts of this individual participant, the appropriateness of medication-assisted treatment for that case. And drug courts are, are expected to create a reviewable record and a rationale. Saying, just saying no is not enough. It is necessary to say why not. This is a court of law, and so if somebody wishes to challenge that decision, it must be reviewable uh, on appeal. And that is the requirement of appellate cases being handed down regarding drug courts. This is not to suggest 
that drug courts don't have very legitimate concerns and barriers to the implementation of medication-assisted treatment. Purpose here is to discuss practical ways to resolve them. One of those concerns is the possibility for misuse or diversion of these medications to um, uh, on the street or to other uh, individuals using med you know music using these drugs either in the program or um, out of, you know on the community. The most effective way to avoid misuse or diversion of medication, quite frankly, is observed administration. A probation officer, a clinical case manager, a trusted pro-social, uh, non-drug-involved family member or friend can observe the person taking that medication, and this in and of itself uh, can basically reduce or even eliminate uh, inappropriate use or diversion. Uh, because the legal standards of care require drug courts to look for least restrictive alternatives before they deny people access to medication, the fact that observed administration resolves many of these problems means that a blanket prohibition is itself not the least restrictive alternative. Drug courts in the course of medication monitoring can look to see whether a medication like buprenorphine or methadone is being tested uh, um, positively so that the person is or is not taking the medication. Looking at actual medication levels is more complicated, uh, requires usually blood testing and more, more expensive procedures. So generally speaking, many drug courts are not gonna have the resources for that, but they can check to confirm that uh, participants are taking the medications they're supposed to be taking. Uh, calling people back on a random basis for, for pill counts to see how many pills they have left. Uh, now, of course, just because somebody takes a pill out of their dispenser doesn't mean that they have in fact taken it, but if people are selling the medications or using too much, they will not have enough pills, and that would be an indication of potential for misuse. Medication event monitoring systems, or the short term for that is MEMS, are um, medication vials or containers where the cap has a microprocessor in it, and every time the individual takes a pill out of the uh, medication vial, it records the date, the time, and the number of pills that were removed, and this it provides a pretty good indicator of medication compliance. It's mostly been used in severe mental health populations, but shows a lot of promise for the criminal justice system. Smartphone applications are now available where you can send a reminder or they can be sent automatically to participants reminding them to take their medication and then you can be using actual observed administration through having the person taking a film of themselves taking the medication to observe ingestion in real time. Again, these things are becoming more and more available and less expensive and it is possible to monitor medication um, uh, use and many studies have shown that this has reduced underutilization and overutilization of medications. Uh, just about all the medications have misuse deterrence formulations. Methadone, for example, is taken in liquid form, uh, which is, uh, cannot be cheeked or tongued. Buprenorphine is available in a, a sublingual tape, which can be placed under the tongue or in the cheek and dissolved. So again, makes it far more difficult to misuse the medication. Uh, both buprenorphine and naltrexone are available in monthly injections and uh, buprenorphine in six-month uh, uh, implants, which can prevent uh, misuse of the medications when people have to take their pills uh, on a daily basis. All participants in drug court should be, should be required to get pre-approval from the program for medications that are intoxicating and or addictive, required to disclose their um, enrollment in a drug court to the prescribing physician, and provide a release of information so that the physician and the drug court can, um, can communicate freely about participants' compliance and use of the medications. Because many participants, even when told they must do this, don't always do that, drug courts are being strongly encouraged to uh, make a, a, a use of what are called prescription drug monitoring programs, PDMPs. These are state or territorial maintained databases that, um, uh, that have information on controlled medication prescriptions that are filled for an individual, usually in the previous 12-month month reporting period. Um, most states have mandatory participation in PDMPs. In fact, I believe the most recent analysis I looked at was something like 85% of drug courts have, I'm sorry, 80% of uh, jurisdictions have mandatory reporting to PDMPs. 
What research shows is that states that have mandatory reporting have fewer dangerous medication interactions because physicians are aware of other medications their clients are taking that they may not tell them about. There are fewer overlapping prescriptions for the same medication, fewer patients obtaining prescriptions from five or more doctors or pharmacies, so in other words, what we sometimes call doctor shopping is substantially reduced, fewer refill authorizations of seven or more months, so participants are required to Get, come back and get these authorizations on in real-time basis. Uh, they are associated with a 3 to 4 percent decrease in overall crime rates, a 5 to 7 percent decrease in violent crime rates. Now, there is some question about whether this reduces opioid overdose and mortality because individuals who already have an opioid use disorder when you reduce the availability of pharmaceutical opioids, will very often switch to illicit opioids, for example, heroin, which in, in nowadays are, are tainted with fentanyl in many cases. So what these PDMPs usually do is they, they prevent new um, uh, initiates into uh, opioid addiction, but have, it's unclear what effect they have on overdose rates, although they do, as I said earlier, reduce um, doctor shopping and crime rates. Mandatory inquiries, although most states require physicians to, um, to register with the PDMP and to submit information to the PDMP, not all physicians are required to inquire about a patient before prescribing it for their patient. So regardless of whether or not your state has a mandatory inquiry policy, drug courts should require all physicians working in their program through an uh, MOU with the drug court to do inquiries on all drug court participants and not only when they first prescribe, but when they are refilling prescriptions or at, um, at regular time periods afterwards to make sure that, that their patients are not uh, obtaining control medications, especially for opioids or benzodiazepines from other providers. Uh, in this slide, and you, you guys will all be receiving this slide, so you actually have uh, links here that will take you to websites. What I've put in here is you can find out whether uh, physician drug monitoring programs in your state are mandatory or permissive for enrollment. Uh, there, as I said earlier, about 83% are mandatory as of January of 2019. You can also find out whether providers, physicians, pharmacies are required to query the PDMP before uh, writing a new prescription, and again, 85% are required. Regardless of whether they're required, you are encouraged to require them to do so as part of your MOU. Uh, big question is whether your PDMPs include information from other jurisdictions. Can they go to another state, get a controlled medication elsewhere, and you know, would you know about it? So you can find out um, by clicking on that web link, you can find out what states share or have reciprocity with your state. And then another question I get frequently is, well, can they share this information with law enforcement, with community corrections, with the courts? The answer is that just about all states permit solicited, which means requested reports to law enforcement. However, uh, they do not necessarily explicitly authorize reports to drug courts or community corrections. About a third of states do explicitly authorize them. Uh, you'd want to check to make sure that there, whether or not there's an explicit authorization in your state, and if not, whether, uh, whether there's any a reason why it would be prohibited. And if, it, if it, for any reason it is, then of course you simply ensure that that information is shared with the physicians working with your program, even though the uh, criminal justice system itself is not soliciting the reports. Uh, here's uh, another link where you can get additional information about your state or territorial prescription drug monitoring programs. <clears throat> now, the big issue that drug courts face is being able to identify authorized MAT providers. As many of you, I'm sure, know, methadone, if it's being used for the treatment of um, a substance use disorder, may only be prescribed and dispensed from an opioid treatment program, a licensed uh, program. Uh, Take-home doses may be permitted but statutorily only after individuals meet specified requirements for treatment attendance, stability, and abstinence. So unless there's a, uh, an OT, OTP program uh, in your community, it would be difficult in many ways to access methadone prescribers. The purpose of buprenorphine, which many of you may be familiar with it as uh, Suboxone or Subutex, 
Uh, it's also called probuthene, uh, what, it's a monthly injection or sublocade. Uh, uh, I think I got that back with sublocade, I think maybe the, one of those is the monthly injection and the other is a six month implant. Uh, they can only be prescribed by physicians who have been uh, spe uh, uh, specifically waivered through what's called the Drug Abuse Treatment Act 2000 waiver. Physicians are required to complete an eight hour training and can treat up to 100 patients in the first year, 275 patients after that. Uh, some people have criticized that and say, is eight hour of training really enough to treat our population? Well, the fact of the matter is eight hour training for buprenorphine is far higher than training from virtually all other medications uh, that are used routinely in medical practice. So in fact, a specific training on a specific medication is not, um, uh, not often required, and this is actually pretty intense for many physicians. Nurse practitioners and physician's assistants are required to complete a 24-hour training, and they can treat up to 100 patients. Uh, a, a big problem here is that about only about 5% of, uh, of physicians have obtained data 2000 waivers. Drug courts may have trouble locating uh, buprenorphine waivered physicians in their communities, and so this is really something for the drug court team. Judges are, may really have to beat the bushes uh, going to speak to local med medical societies, local physicians' practices, um, uh, getting the word out that they need providers to help them, to help treat their clients, and offering their assistance and helping those physicians to achieve waivers, which I'll uh, discuss in a moment. Now, Trexone, which is a blockade medication, um, including Vivitrol, which is a long-acting blockade, it is not itself an opioid, uh, can be prescribed and dispensed by virtually any licensed medical provider competent to do so, including physicians, physicians' assistants, and nurse practitioners. So getting naltrexone providers is generally substantially less complicated. If you or your program is looking to find providers in your community, many, uh, many uh, uh, programs will tell me that there are no providers, we can't find anybody to do this in our community, and then if I go on one of these locator services, I can find several within a 10 or 15 mile radius of those programs they just were not aware of. These are uh, websites, if you, link on, if you click on them, you can query these sites by state, by county, by zip code to find providers near you. Uh, behavioral health service providers, specifically those uh, data 2000 waivered buprenorphine providers, finding opioid treatment programs and the like. You can also locate providers by contacting the single state agency for substance use in your jurisdiction. Your state would normally be the Department of Health and Human, uh, health and Human Services or whatever single state agency for substance use treatment. Local colleges and medical schools will often have faculty who are, are wavered and, and trained in this area, or your county or state board of health. Because, as I had mentioned earlier, many physicians who could be doing this are not data 2000 wavered. Here are some websites that you can click on to help physicians um, complete the application forms, take the online eight or 24 hour training for nurse practitioners, and become data 2000 wavered. It gives information on what it takes to maintain the credentials uh, and, and also to, um, uh, to provide even additional information, study materials and the like to, to pass uh, the certification requirements. So this is the kind of thing I think if judges send letters out and go have brown bag lunches, invite physicians, go to local medical groups and speak about the need for these services and make people aware that these trainings do exist, that it's not as complicated as some people may think, that they can become data 2000 waiver, we can increase the number of people out there who are capable of serving our clients. Uh, what is not happening and what absolutely needs to happen is that any participant in a drug court program, uh, any participant with a substance use disorder, especially in the midst of an opioid crisis, an opioid epidemic, should be screened routinely, all participants, for symptoms of an opioid use disorder. This should include whether or not they in the past or currently are using opioids, whether they've experienced withdrawal symptoms, cravings, whether they have an overdose history, whether they have been in opioid treatment before, whether they have received medication-assisted treatment in the past. Uh, many uh, uh, assessment procedures for drug courts do not ask about cravings, withdrawal, or overdose history, which is 
absolutely um, inex unacceptable, inexcusable in the midst of an opioid crisis. Any person who screens positive should be referred to a licensed and trained medical provider, physician, nurse practitioner, or physician's assistant, assuming that one is available, and hopefully you should be able to locate such people for a follow-up diagnostic evaluation and determination of whether they're suitable for MAT. Uh, even if they say they don't want medication-assisted treatment, they should still be referred for follow-up assessment. Uh, this does not mean you're forcing a medication on them, but you are requiring a thorough diagnostic evaluation for purposes of en entering your program. The reason to get this taken care of early on is because motivation changes, situations change, participants change their mind very often after multiple relapses and they're facing a potential revocation, a potential jail sanction, they may very often change their mind about MAT and you don't want to then first have to re refer them for assessment which could take several days or a week or two and slow down the process. You want to have the case ready, willing and, and able to go for medication when needed. Another issue is many participants will say that they're willing to take medication but they're not interested in the other services in the program. Uh, the fact that people are motivated for medications but not medi uh, motivated for counseling is not a contraindication for medication-assisted treatment. What research has shown is that when people first enter uh, uh, programs, when they are clinically unstable, they're experiencing withdrawal symptoms, drug cravings, anhedonia, or the inability to experience pleasure. Uh, basically, clinical stabilization is very often the first order of business. And until the case is clinically stabilized, many people are not able to have a very difficult time taking advantage of moral recognition tr counseling and, and, and relapse prevention counseling and the like. And so motivation is really, for psychosocial counseling, is not a contraindication. Uh, those, the uh, citations to those studies are in the resource guide that John had mentioned earlier, uh, and it will be available in your resources if you want to know where that evidence comes from. Now, of course, in a drug court, we do require people to go to counseling, and you should continue to do so. I'm not suggesting it's not necessary. I'm simply saying that motivation for it is not a contraindication for these medications. Uh, we've put in your materials examples of screening instruments that your clinical experts should be using, and many are not in drug courts. There are some of these examples of, uh, that, spe that focus specifically on opioid dependence. There are instruments that focus specifically on withdrawal symptoms, drug cravings, and overdose uh, risk potential. These are short tools. They can be, de be delivered uh, within a matter of minutes by trained providers in your programs, and we should be looking at these symptoms routinely for all of our participants instead of overlooking what could be a life-threatening disorder. Um, Many, of, many programs send participants to self-help recovery groups in the community, as they should. Uh, the most commonly available are those that follow the 12-step model, Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, and the like. The official policy of NA is to accept medication-assisted treatment, despite what many people say. And they are on the record in writing saying that that includes agonists, methadone, and buprenorphine are not contraindications for uh, Narcotics Anonymous. However, despite their official policy, many groups do, in fact, disapprove of MAT or actively even discourage participants from entering the groups while they're still on the medication. A study that my colleagues and I recently did in drug courts found that 58% of participants in drug courts said that they themselves either experienced or they witnessed other people in the program um, experiencing disapproval of MAT from peer support group members. So there is undoubtedly a stigma uh, associated with this. There are two ways to handle this. The first is to explicitly prepare participants in your program for this possibility, telling them this can happen, letting, uh, you, you know, um, arming them with the facts that NA supports MAT so that they can bring that up helping them to discuss how and whether and when to share their use of MAT in the group increases their group satisfaction and tenure in the program. So it's a preparatory issue. There is also a website called MARA, Medication Assisted Recovery Anonymous, and this lists places where you can locate peer support groups that are explicitly accepting of medication assisted treatment. And if there are none in your jurisdiction, uh, information on how you, you can get your participants to set up 
to seed and to maintain their own medication-assisted recovery anonymous groups. So this is not something that we should just simply accept stigma and, uh, and disapproval as a, as a normal pro um, uh, course of business. Many programs are concerned about how to pay for MAT. Um, most rural and urban jurisdictions have federally qualified health centers somewhere available to them, and these all offer buprenorphine at highly discounted rates. Many drug courts have been quite successful at negotiating reduced rates from pharmaceutical companies, those especially that make Vivitrol and that make um, uh, Suboxone. Um, you may or may not be aware of the 340B drug discount program. These are programs that require any pharmacy, any drug manufacturer that participates in Medicaid, and they basically all do, that, provide, that they must provide medications at significantly reduced prices to covered entities. What's a covered entity? Um, rural, uh, rural health centers, community hospitals that treat a disproportionate share of poor and uninsured patients, these are a number of different or, um, facilities that basically treat our patients, and if, if these uh, manufacturers are required to offer discounted rates for these medications. Now, it does not matter if your individual patient is on Medicaid or not. They can have no coverage whatsoever. They could be covered by private insurance. They could be covered by other types of third-party reimbursement, and it doesn't matter. If the drug manufacturer participates in Medicaid then, and they serve a covered entity, they must provide these medications at discounted rates. Medicaid um, is um, uh, many states uh, are Medicaid expansion states, so they're more fully available to a larger proportion of people. Not, not all states, obviously, is that true. As of February of 2018, 36 states and territories covered methadone explicitly through Medicaid. 51 covered buprenorphine, 49 covered naltrexone, and more than half had substantially increased coverage for naloxone, which you may know as Narcan, which is to reverse opioid overdose. So very often people tell me that these medications aren't covered, and that's in many cases not true. Uh, there is discretion in Medicaid to cover rehabilitative services, broadly defined to include substance use counseling, peer support specialists, supportive housing, and vocational services. And most importantly, in many respects, there is discretion to cover benefits assistance. These are people working with your participants to help them get the coverage they're legally entitled to. Many jurisdictions, many states, many third-party uh, managers will, um, will, will erect barriers and make it practically difficult for people to access uh, benefits to which they are entitled, and benefits assistance can help people manage those, those barriers and those hurdles. I'm trying to get this to go down. There we go. As for staff training, it is particularly important to train your staff on medication-assisted treatment, common misconceptions about these medications. However, what we have learned is that knowledge acquisition generally declines within a month. So it is critically important for you to get your MAT treatment providers and your drug court staff meeting together on a regular basis, preferably once a month for the first few months and then at least quarterly to discuss issues that are coming up barriers to implementation, uh, common concerns, to designate peer mentors or supervisors in your program. We tend to call them champions. You know, who's going to be the person who's constantly advocating and pushing for continued organizational support for medications? I list here two studies you might be interested in that describe in great detail uh, staff training exercises that have been proven to increase actual use of medication-assisted treatment bringing MAT providers and criminal justice professionals together to discuss mutual concerns, resolve barriers, teaching staff how to use naloxone opi overdose reversal kits, showing them how to do it, providing them with videotape boosters has been shown to substantially increase not just knowledge. We're not here to just increase knowledge. We're here to in in increase actual utilization. Stigma is a big issue in these programs. It's very important for us to work on changing the language we use. Instead of using terms like addicts and, uh, you know, and drug abuse, to switch that to people who are in recovery. Uh, relapse is a more negative term than recurrence of use, people suffering from substance use disorders. 
Um, we need to be able to describe how hard people try to stop using without these medications and how often they're devastated when they're unsuccessful. You need to, people need to get a sense of that. Using vignettes and examples, describing successful efforts at recovery, describing all the misuse prevention strategies I mentioned earlier, observed administration, helping people to understand that there are ways to stop misuse and diversion. We don't have to just say, no, you can't have these medications. There are other things we can do. Educating on the disease model of addiction, including showing pictures of brain injuring, imaging studies, describing the kinds of things that precipitate drug, drug use like trauma, poor prescription practices, ad, exposure to advertising, negative peer influences, describing medical and psychiatric disorders that frequently co-occur with substance use disorders helps build empathy and reduces stigma. Now, finally, I just want to end with a lot of programs will, will say to me that what very often happens is they will, when they use medications, as soon as they put somebody in jail on a jail sanction, the jail immediately takes people off these medications as a matter of course. Uh, while I'm not encouraging you to get into conflicts with jails or to get into litigation with jails by any means, uh, the emerging appellate evidence is quite clear that that is unconstitutional that, or, or certainly a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Blanket prohibitions or routine denials of medication-assisted treatment for pretrial detainees and even individuals who are being held as a sentence violates the Americans with Disabilities Act according to three federal cases decided just in the past year and a half. Um, the Rehabilitation Act, if you're working with federal uh, uh, Bureau of Prisons, and may even violate the Eighth Amendment's prohibition against deliberate indifference. I'm not suggesting you sue jail so much as bring their attention to these cases so they begin to understand that they cannot continue taking people off these medications. At least one Department of Justice warning letter has gone out to a treatment court saying that a treatment court that treats participants differently because they're receiving medications violates the ADA as well. Uh, those of you who want to get examples of sample letters that you can use to educate jail officials and others about the importance of medications, you can get at the uh, Legal Action Center website and the Citation, the uh, link is there for you. So that, um, that concludes uh, uh, my presentation. I'm going to move it along to, to Steve Hansen, but we should have plenty of time later for a Q&A. Thank you very much. Thanks, Doug. What we're going to go over and um, sort of overlap with some of the things that, that Doug talked about were the obstacles to implementing MAT and these include stigma, <clears throat> some of the logistics and access, particularly um, to medications like methadone, where you need a methadone clinic, the cost involved, <clears throat> and uh, go over again the diversion concerns. And stigma is probably the largest obstacle to MAT, and it's frequently based on philosophical bias and erroneous beliefs about the medication. And um, the beliefs are, you know, like many people have achieved recovery without medication. Well, that's true. Um, if you take, have to take a medication, it's not real recovery, false. Um, about 12 years ago, the National Drug Court Conference, we met in um, Boston, um, and there was actually almost hostility towards the notion of using MAT, um, as this didn't afford people a real chance at recovery. Um, we were basically just condemning them to be addicted to another substance, et cetera, despite that there's a lot of evidence um, saying that that's not true. Um, they thought we're just replacing one drug with another. Uh, no, it's a medication at proper dosage levels. It's not going to produce a level of intoxication, um, though people will be able to um, act normally, look normal, et cetera. Um, they thought people on methadone are just zombies. Um, this was false. Um, you would frequently see people who are early on in the stabilization um, who will be um, at the methadone clinic, and they're working through getting their dose to the proper level, um, still dealing with some residual withdrawal effects from the heroin and other things that are going on. Um, but people who are on MAT can function very normally. They can take care of their children. Um, we've had a couple of cases where patients who have been doing well on methadone, not using other substances, not committing crimes, paying their bills, going to work, um, where family courts have decided that because they're on methadone that they're um, unfit parents and taking the children away. Um, and that completely goes against um, issues like the ADA, 
um, and really understanding what the dynamic is that when somebody's on this medication, um, you wouldn't be able to tell one from another. Now, um, <clears throat> when you look at what happens with um, you know, driving by a methadone clinic, the folks who are standing in line look like they're still using drugs. Um, well, generally, these are the people who just started. They haven't reached full stabilization yet. Um, as they continue in treatment, they look and feel better, and they also don't have to stand in the line every day. And we really don't get to see the people who are doing well. So somebody who's been on it for a period of time is very successful, stabilized. They're going to come in quickly. Um, they might be getting a week's worth of um, dose at a time, um, and they're off doing all the normal things that they would have to be. Now, some of the things that we have to do is um, look at some of the historical perspectives. Um, and many of the people that have been in this field for a long time um, are in their own recovery. And what they were told and came to believe about MAT influenced their treatment recommendations. Um, and many counselors would not recommend MAT as it conflicted with their beliefs. Um, we had to deal with that in New York where um, courts were not using MAT. When I asked the judge why not, he says, well, my treatment person says um, it's not really good for people, so we're trying to follow what the treatment person says. So we had to do a lot of education to our treatment programs um, and point out many of the things that the court also hears around the effectiveness and importance of using MAT, particularly as related to opioids and the current crisis we're in, um, with analogs like fentanyl and carfentanyl on the street, making it very dangerous, high risk for overdose. And so we're trying to make sure that um, MATs become recognized as a pathway for recovery. Um, the variety of studies have shown the best way to address those mistaken beliefs, as um, Doug mentioned, is education, um, teaching people what, what's going on. And if you're um, looking to work with an OTP, go visit the OTP program. Go see what they're doing. Talk with the patients. Find out what it's like um, for them to be on it, what the experience of not having the medication is like. And then there's a number of um, evidence-based practices, um, and there's that SAMHSA guide that um, John and Doug have been mentioning before. Now, some of the logistics is really uh, complicated. Methadone for opioid use disorder is highly regulated. Um, there's no other medication for anything else that's regulated as much as methadone is. Um, they're not, clinics are not available everywhere. Um, some places have caps on the number of patients. So if you're at your cap, say it's 150 patients, and there's 20 people waiting to get in, they're going to have to wait to get in, and they're at high risk for uh, potential overdose. Uh, buprenorphine, um, as Doug mentioned, is the only medication that we know of that requires special certification from the federal government to uh, prescribe it. No other um, medication does that. Um, and this might be deterring from offering because doctors would have to give up time um, and not get revenue in order to um, take the course in order to um, be able to prescribe buprenorphine. There are also the caps that are on the number of patients. Um, and um, that can be challenging um, as you're trying to find folks to refer to. Does the doctor have enough room in their cap in order to handle um, new patients? Now, without insurance, the cost of medications can uh, be fairly great. Uh, Vivitrol is estimated about $1,176 a month for that shot. Buprenorphine, $460 a month. Um, and then methadone, 500 a month. And the methadone is not just the cost of the medication. That includes um, other services, the counseling and other things that go along with it. Um, addressing the diversion concerns, buprenorphine is commonly diverted. Um, in some settings, people try and divert methadone. It's really complicated involves cotton balls in your mouth, et cetera, et cetera, regurgitation. Um, we won't have to go there. Um, but some patients with low tolerance to buprenorphine may experience some effects from it. But most patients who um, receive buprenorphine remain on the medication to avoid withdrawal symptoms. And this is what it's prescribed for. Um, so to think of it sort of as what happens if I can't get my other opioid um, and um, experiences very, very uncomfortable withdrawal symptoms, 
um, what can I do? And so that increases the value um, of the buprenorphine uh, diversion. And preventing diversion is very difficult. There's a lot of things, particularly the strips are easy to hide. Um, patients will take half their strip to deal with their issues while being able to sell the other half of the strip. And um, while diversion is a real issue, it should not deter us from prescribing it for people who actually need it. And why it's really important uh, is because MAT saves lives. Studies have compared MAT versus non-MAT treatment for opioid use disorders, and non-MAT methods have been shown to have fatality rates as high as 20%. That is one in five. And you know what has better odds than one in five is Russian roulette. Um, there you're one in six. And no sane individual is going to um, play Russian roulette because that risk is so high. We shouldn't um, be putting people at risk of one in five um, by saying, no, you can't have MAT. And in the comparison groups in those studies, the MAT methods had 0% fatalities. So um, again, this is a real important issue about keeping people alive. And helping people stay alive is our first and primary objective. Um, back when drug courts started, our primary role was sort of keeping people out of jail who didn't need to be in jail and getting them treatment that would prevent them from getting entangled in the criminal justice system down the road. Now we see drug courts as acting as a primary um, player in helping to keep these participants alive. And it's critical that we give them the best tools, the most effective um, evidence-based um, treatment approaches that there are out there. And now I'll turn it over to Judge Flurkey. Thanks, Steve. Hi, everyone. Appreciate the time. Um, Sean Flurkey here. These guys have covered kind of the best practices, the standards. Um, one of the things that always strikes me in thinking about the criminal justice system, and it probably gives Doug some gray hair, is that when you look around the room, most of us are liberal arts majors. There's not a lot of hard science people. I, I talked at the Reno Judicial College a couple of months ago. There were 50 judges, opioid um, lead judges from around the nation there to receive training on best practices on these issues. And I asked how many of you are hard science people, and one <laughs> raised her hand. Um, data can be tricky to uptake, um, but we keep we keep bringing it, we keep talking about it, and um, you got to have it land. Here are some here are some resources that I think are helpful. The first one on the left is the SAMHSA Opioid Overdose Prevention Toolkit. I find that really helpful to give to other system professionals to try to help them understand um, what's at play, what's at stake, kind of the, the massive issues that we're facing. Um, I'm in Duluth. It's a town of 86,000 people. I was on search warrants two weeks ago. I signed uh, search warrants for three opioid deaths in five days. Um, my community's aware, um, but it can be a good toolkit to, to give to folks who maybe aren't. We've all mentioned the SAMHSA publication on medically assisted treatment um, in criminal justice systems or settings. It's fantastic. Uh, Doug mentioned trauma. I think Steve mentioned trauma. SAMHSA has the trauma-informed uh, approach guidance. That's the middle document I have for you. Um, you can't do this work if you don't have uh, an understanding and building understanding of trauma. A couple other resources or anything Bethel Vanderkoop does or anything Gabor Mate does. Uh, I wrote the fourth, uh, fourth uh, item that we list here for the National Judicial Opioid Task Force. It's a short monograph on um, how judges can build teams. So if you're looking to build a court or, or maybe more importantly looking to build a team out into the community to try and tackle this, it can have some, some good insights for you. And then I included the um, drug court petitioner fact sheet, all good, all good resources. Um, Others have said it. Uh, it's in the SAMHSA um, judicial settings document. 
this needs a champion. This doesn't happen. This change in our communities doesn't happen without a champion. And my argument is always the judge is the champion. Um, a judge needs to become informed, make connections into the community, and champion this process. Um, our jail, sadly, was one of the places that did not offer um, any MAT until we started a community um, kind of collaboration, applied for some grants, and now we're offering Suboxone at our jail. Um, that started through emails and phone calls, me inviting people to the table. Um, and not stopping till we got it there. Uh, I didn't have to sue anybody. I don't think I have authority to sue anybody, but a judge can be the champion, and none of this will start without a champion. I'd suggest folks think about Narcan as a really good start on some of this. Uh, we had law enforcement several years ago, uh, we were pushing to um, equip all of our law enforcement throughout the entire area with uh, Narcan, Naloxone, had some um, press back, uh, kind of dealt with that, did some training, got Narcan into people's hands. Our sheriff's office, the first person a deputy saved way out in the sticks with Narcan um, was a mom that he found lying on her gravel driveway with her little children watching her die. Um, he uh, administered Narcan by the time the uh, paramedics got there, she climbed into the uh, ambulance on our own two feet, that story spread like wildfire and people's hearts and minds were changed. And I think some of this really is hearts and minds. Um, Steve talked about uh, maybe some kind of old school thinking about that's not how it was done back in the day or this isn't how I achieved recovery or this isn't the path that I followed. Um, some of this is honestly changing hearts and minds, especially when you're looking at um, folks who may not be real responsive to data. Um, I, I will find on my teams every now and then I'll be assigned somebody who doesn't believe in MAT um, or who doesn't believe in a best practice. I'm a history major, but I've come to embrace the research and I won't do anything unless I know it's research supported. Um, I've had side conversations with folks and encourage them that we're going to follow the data in, in my courtroom and on my teams. The analogy I use is the research around washing your hands before a surgeon cuts into you. The surgeon's always scrub and scrub and scrub. If I had a surgeon who said, um, I don't believe in that, uh, I would look for a different surgeon. So I think as judges, we need to lead on that issue too. We need to be in, we need to insist on best practice. Uh, Doug mentioned um, it can be hard to find prescribers. It can be hard to find folks who are who are interested. Um, in Duluth, we've done a lot of outreach to providers. Uh, we have methadone and suboxone uh, treatment uh, facility, but we also needed prescribers. Um, I have a client in my court who is um, who has been receiving Suboxone for over a year. Um, his sister happens to be a wavered provider. She's a, the chief resident at one of our local um, medical practices. The two of them and sometimes me uh, go around to different medical groups. We will go wherever, whenever. I don't care how big or how small the crowd is and talk about the life-saving capacity of these medications. Um, and I think we can't underestimate the power of people's stories and the powers of power of um, kind of shared experience. It, um, you have to reach out. You just have to reach out. And as a judge, um, I think that I, I rarely have people that don't respond to an invitation to a cup of coffee. Um, or don't respond to coming to a meeting. Uh, you can convene and convene and convene and reach out. And I think that's um, that's part of the job. I had a, a sad conversation with a person who's a national representative for a certain um, element of, of our work. And she said that, well, in her groups, 
in, in her circles, people tended to not change their minds until somebody they knew, like their nephew or niece or um, someone in their direct circles went down with an overdose. And I think I, I was just mortified at that. I, I, I can't believe that, that we are at a point where I have to know somebody in my immediate circle before I, before I would um, get on board. The problems with finding prescribers are significant and real, um, but if, if I, I need to change my, I need to change my um, thinking, then I'm going to do that and I'm going to reach out. I know some of you are having a hard time hearing me. I'm going to talk louder. Um, I think sharing stories, I think champion, I think judges can do so much to reach out into their community and start talking with folks. I, uh, uh, here's my theme, embrace the research. I offer this video for you guys. Uh, it's Dr. Corey Waller. It's an addiction overview. It isn't specifically geared towards MAT, uh, but it's a real, real, real concise and fascinating description of, of the addictive process and how someone can um, find themselves struggling with a substance use disorder. I use it for every new team member. I give it to family members. I give it to anybody interested. Uh, it can go a long ways towards opening people's view of what the struggle is with, with addictive behavior, with substance use disorder. It does a deeper dive than I can even understand into kind of brain chemistry and the impacts. It's, I think it's 24 minutes long and it's well worth it. I, nobody comes to this work understanding everything. When I started as a judge, I knew nothing about recovery. I knew nothing about treatment. Um, everything I knew was wrong. Uh, so I had to learn and learn and learn and, and read and, and um, try to strive to understanding. So bringing someone on board, I think it's really important to get them grounded in an understanding of uh, substance use disorder, uh, recovery, and then the available tools that we have. I also listed several different um, organizations that are there to help you. Um, do you guys know NADCP? Um, NDCI is the National Drug Court Institute, NPC Research, shout out to Shannon Carey and the work they're doing out in uh, uh, Portland, uh, fantastic resources about best practices and getting up people up to speed. I think Steve said a lot of the problem that we're facing is just folks who don't understand and haven't been educated. So I'm going to work to educate, educate, educate. Uh, as I advocate out in, in my community. There's a ton of online resources that you can find as well. Um, I don't think our problem is a lack of information. I think it's hearts and minds and then uh, good education, good solid education for people who are interested. Uh, I offer this quote, I clicked twice, sorry. It's a Margaret Mead quote that I love. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Um, I've been doing this work 15 years and a couple of months as a judge, and um, our drug courts, our treatment courts, our mental health courts, our veterans courts have truly changed people's lives and truly changed the, changed the lay of the land in the criminal justice system. And it's just a small group of thoughtful people doing this work, and it spreads and spreads and spreads. So. I will hand this back, but thank you so much. I sure appreciate the work everybody's doing and your willingness to be here on a Monday. Okay. okay. Um, thank you very much, all three of the presenters, um, for very interesting and very thought-provoking presentations. Um, we will open the field now for the floor for question and answer. Some did come in during the presentations, so we'll start with those. And um, the first question, I think um, any of the presenters can jump in to answer, but I think Dr. Marlowe, you might be the, the best person to answer the first question from Don, Don Swartz, um, whether or not drug courts are, are, um, that they're requiring MAT, does that mean that you have to offer MAT for those who are um, interested or are drug court participants to be mandated to be active in MAT? 
So, no, the, the mandate means that you cannot exclude somebody from your program uh, or prevent them from graduating as, because they're taking the medication. Forcing somebody to take medication against their will can only occur legally in a few contexts. If it's a medical emergency, the person's unconscious or, or their life is immediately in danger, you can give them medication without consent. You can also give medication without consent if somebody has been declared sort of incompetent to make that decision and they have a substitute I think that decision. The first two. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you very much. Um, the next question, and perhaps Mr. Hansen, you might want to address it, is whether or not there are any steps being taken to collaborate between bordering states with PDMPs? Um, there are some states who are talking about it, but it does have some um, relatively complex um, legality issues as well as IT um, in terms of getting that cross-pollination on things, um, and um, it's complicated. <laughs> Collaboration uh, this is Doug. Can, can, I, can I comment? Yeah. Absolutely. I just, uh, there's, there should be a, a link on one of my slides where you can find out what states do have reporting reciprocity with your own state. So Steve's right. It's, it's a very early burgeoning kind of an issue, but there is a place to find out what's covered for your state's reporting. Okay. Thank you. The next question, and maybe all three of you want to weigh in on this, is from a director of nursing of inmate health who wants to know about um, diversion problems in the jail and how to get the, cor the correctional staff on board with MAT because of that. Well, we've been doing a lot of work um, with uh, getting MAT into both our county jails and the state correctional system. And um, SAMHSA just put on a conference last month in Rhode Island, um, which was one of the first uh, state correction systems to incorporate MAT. Um, into their practice, and diversion is a real concern. Um, and again, you're weighing the risk, or the risk of what happens to people um, when they leave um, corrections if they haven't been on their medication. And we know that there's a very high um, risk of mortality in the first few weeks after release from custody, and a lot of that is due to um, while in custody, their tolerance has gone away, they haven't received a medication, um, and you know, very few people are thinking, yes, yeah, somebody who came in and um, spent a couple months here because of shoplifting um, their life um, isn't worth saving, um, so we don't really care about that. We really want people to be able to survive. A life is good. And so the same things that we've been talking about, education to um, the correction staff, getting the buy-in, um, from either the sheriff or the um, superintendent, whoever is running the facility, um, and it can it can be incorporated. And there's a number of different um, processes that um, corrections officers and medical staff use to um, you know, limit the amount of diversion. And you know, they're trying to overcome um, you know, like sort of the correction perspective. We're doing everything we can to keep out of the building, and now you're just going to walk it in the front door. But when you start to explain to them you know, why you're doing it, what the risks are, um, and um, as the judge mentioned before, a lot of people are getting impacted by this directly, where they have family members or people that they know who have died of an overdose. And um, there's a, a, a lot less resistance than there was a while ago um, to this notion. Can I weigh in on Can that, I? too? No, go ahead, Doug. No, you go ahead, Josh. Um, agreed. Uh, we've spent a lot of time working with folks on the monitoring piece to make sure that uh, diversion uh, is not happening. Um, that I think that's essential. Um, second, the best way I've seen jail uh, corrections officers um, grab this quickly is one, policy and procedure, but two, I've known jails where uh, folks are actually on Suboxone and working there, and they've been really good about understanding the need and the um, the, the impetus behind the medication. Um, educate, 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 and then finally policy and procedure. This is not a this is not a personal choice. This is what we're going to do. Yeah, 
I, I'd also like to just comment that those cases that I had mentioned uh, towards the end of my talk uh, all address this issue because the many jails and prisons were not letting uh, inmates receive buprenorphine or, or methadone as a matter of policy because of fears of diversion. And what the all three of the appellate courts said was uh, that kind of across the board um, mandate is simply no longer acceptable. That you know uh, that it, you can only re deny these medications if there's no less restrictive alternative. And the courts talked about all the things you can do that Steve and, and Judge Flerke just mentioned. You can do observed administration. You can have separate um, uh, units for individuals receiving medication-assisted treatment. You can have individual cell-to-cell -cell administration, dispersal windows. There's, there are many things that can be done, and until and unless a jail has exhausted those efforts, it can't be an across-the-board um, uh, uh, reason for a blanket policy. So this kind of gets down to this you know, least restrictive alternative. If there are other things you can do to deal with this problem, then you need to do them, is what the courts are saying. Thank you very much, all of you, for weighing in on that question. Um, the next question comes from Chris Brown and wants to know about a participant that's indicated that he does not want to be um, on MAT if he's accepted back into the drug court program. Um, can we hold this person to this agreement if they're accepted back into the program under the current federal laws? I'm not sure I understand the question. Is this is somebody who's refusing medication? Um, the, the, well, the question as it's written is the participant has indicated they do not want MAT if accepted back into the program. I think by implication perhaps he had um, been dismissed or had, had terminated in the program and now is coming back but doesn't want M um, MAT. Um, okay. I guess the question is, what, can they require it? So the, w the way it generally goes, if somebody has been discharged from a drug court and they're sort of applying to return, usually you're going to have what's called a show cause hearing, where there, you know, the, the person is going to basically is making an application to, be, to come back to the program and needs to establish what's going to be different this time, that, you know, that what, what I'm going to do to do better in the program and what I need from the program. And so if the person can offer up a you know, reasonable treatment plan that they will agree to that seems like it has a, a reasonable chance of succeeding, then you can do it. But if the clinical assessment is we've exhausted non-MAT and the person is not getting better and they're still saying they won't accept it, at some point you can discharge the person from the program because they're unamenable or unwilling to take the, the treatments that they need to get better. But there needs to be some finding of that by the court. Okay, and thank you. Just, can I weigh in a bit? And Doug, uh, I want to bounce this off of you. Um, Go right ahead. Uh, I, maybe I'm maybe I'm misunderstanding the the thrust of the question too. But I think if the question were posed differently, can we require that person to continue to not uh, engage in medically assisted therapy, even if clinicians recommend it, they change their mind? It seems like a uh, a, a good practice for that person, I would be reluctant to say that you could uh, hold the person to not engaging in MAT if clinical providers and, you know, they made the decision they wanted to engage in MAT down the road. I think I'm right there, that it would have to be reassessed as you went. You could not make that a condition that lasted forever just as a blanket prohibition for that person. Right. I, I think, think there's uh, – yes, that's right. I think there, you know, one of the issues that you pointed out earlier, Doug, about um, there's only a few circumstances where you can require somebody to take a medication against their will. And um, the part of the, the thing that the drug court offers for people is the ability to stay engaged in treatment and to work through with both the clinicians and the court staff and the other support on helping the person get through to the – um, the best pathway for recovery that will work for them. And if somebody's reluctant to take a medication at a certain point, um, I wouldn't say, no, you can't come into the court. I'd say, okay, come on into the court and let's keep working and see how you're doing and here are some alternatives if, if you seem to be experiencing a struggle. Um, the engagement with the treatment process is really important and getting through um, some ambivalence. Somebody might be being told by their sponsor, no, that's not the way to do it. 
Um, so uh, it's a complex um, position to be in, um, but we wouldn't want to mandate people to take a medication against their will, um, and we wouldn't want judges to be in the role of determining what medications people should take. Right, exactly, exactly. We have commitment hearings where we commit people uh, as mentally ill and we uh, have proceedings where we force medication. Um, the judge's question is never which medication, uh, Risperidol or, or Haldol. The question is whether the person, uh, whether they should be forced and then the doctors are making decisions around which medication. Okay, speaking of medications, we have a couple of specific questions, um, and if any of the panelists would like to answer them. The first one is how long does Sublocade stay in someone's system after their last injection? Is it possible for them to test negative and then test positive? Does anyone I'm gonna want say, to? I'm gonna say that there's probably a chance that could happen. Okay. Yeah, I, I think if, uh, if it's, that's probably more of a toxicologist question, and you don't have a toxicologist on the line right now. But uh, they generally last; it's, the injection lasts about a month, as I understand. So it's like 28, 30 days, my understanding. And you know whether or not you could have you know increases and decreases in serum levels. That is a question that we would need to pose to uh, some of our toxicology experts. So if somebody wants to email me, I'll find out the answer for you. Okay. Thank you. Um, we also had a question in terms of interpreting um, drug uh, the levels on drug tests to determine whether or not it's being misused, whether or not the levels are a good a tool to use, or should it be considered only a positive and negative basis? The, the best way to approach those tests is it's positive or negative. Right. Um, any type of level interpretation, which was driven primarily by looking at um, marijuana levels, um, which could be very it's misleading so uh, depending on what kind of test you were using and how you were trying to interpret. Um, yes, no is the best answer because most of those tests are qualitative, not quantitative. Yeah, if you wanted to do an investigation. If you wanted to do an investigation. Sorry. Okay. Um, Another question about um, MAT is how long is a patient typically or on average expected to remain on MAT? Um, she says that she's had several participants who want to get off Suboxone but are medically advised to stay on. So uh, this is Doug. I'll take a, a crack at this one. Uh, so the first thing to understand is that these are really maintenance medications. So they are going to achieve the desired effects and, the, um, and those effects are likely to last if people are maintained on them for a substantial period of time. The, uh, according to the Surgeon General, most successful tapers from methadone uh, and or suboxone will occur after somebody has been on a maintenance regimen for an average of three years. Now that does not mean everybody needs to be on it for three years. It means that that's an average. So some people are maybe on it substantially shorter and others longer. The person should be clinically stable for at least a year, preferably 18 to 24 months, which means not just that they're not using, but that they are not experiencing withdrawal, cravings, uh, a lack of interest in, in life, that they're able to maintain employment. So they're really stable for at least a year and a half to two years before you would be doing a medication taper. Most failures occur because the taper was done too soon and when the participant wasn't ready. So um, if for a drug court program, I think the assumption should be that, that, it, that very, relatively few people would be tapering off the medication before they graduated from a drug court, given the typical length of a drug court. Okay, speaking of graduating from drug court, we had a question of whether or not there's any follow-up um, regarding MAT once someone graduates from the drug court program. Well, if they're continuing on with their MAT, they should be either continuing to work with their OTP program for methadone um, <clears throat> or uh, an, an outpatient or other provider um, for their buprenorphine or Vivitrol if they're using those two. 
Um, so again, you know, like the notion is to try and stay on these um, as long as it takes for somebody to be stabilized and to be um, reach a point where they may decide with the doctor's advice um, to taper off. Um, being on this for a long, long time um, should not have the stigma and you know, people automatically thinking, oh, I have to cut off it in a certain time period. Um, we've been looking at some data in New York um, where people who have you know, like just dropped out of um, methadone or buprenorphine programs and the mortality rate in the first three days is astronomical um, for folks who are doing that. So the risk of stopping abruptly um, and not working through um, a variety of issues, including a long, appropriate uh, tapering, um, is really risky. Um, we, it's, at the very beginning during the polling, we mentioned that we had a lot of people from rural areas that were on the webinar, and I wondered if um, uh, perhaps, Mr. Hansen, given the fact that a lot of New York State is, in fact, rural, most people don't realize that, but um, what are the best practices for MAT expansion, particularly in rural areas? So the things that we've been doing in rural areas is trying to really um, beat the drum of getting um, buprenorphine um, and Vivitrol available in all parts of the state. Um, methadone is pretty much indicated, you know, uh, reduced to where, how close you are to a methadone program, and um, it might not be at all practical for you to go there every day um, if it's a couple hour drives to get it. So trying to get um, local communities working through county health departments, working with the law enforcement, the drug courts in the area, um, et cetera, to sort of talk about, okay, how do we get uh, build up the capacity? Um, and sometimes it's a little difficult, but if you can particularly get the local health department um, engaged and uh, focus on how this is a method to um, help save lives um, and will reduce other problems, including crime related to um, opioid use, that you can get folks on board. Um, it's a challenge. Working with the local medical society can be helpful, getting them to have somebody come in and talk about um, what's going on. We've also had in New York where we've sent um, groups out who are providing the, um, the necessary training um, for free and just, okay, we're going to be at the county health department um, next Wednesday, and if you want to get the training, please stop by. That's what we're doing here, too. We're looking for medical champions and then... Um, having them do like a, a one day training, advertise it out, get free food and go to go to rural areas and try to get wavered physicians. But a, a medical champion can help you a ton. One of the other things that we've been working on is getting people to start inductions in emergency rooms. Um, emergency rooms are frequently, they'll bring somebody in who is in an overdose or just was reversed from an overdose um, and they're no longer in you know, like immediate need of health care because um, of a risk of dying. They're doing okay, so they say, okay, fine, you can go. Uh, but instead, some of our hospitals are starting to say, okay, um, now we're going to put you on a, a buprenorphine. We're going to give you a three-day dose um, and um, get you connected to a prescriber out in the community who can continue on, um, thinking that people at that point are kind of vulnerable um, and would be open to the suggestion of getting into the medication program. Speaking of um, reversing overdose, we have a question um, whether or not, um, if any of the panelists have any experience with or concerns about liability with the use of Narcan. The person asking the question said that in, um, in, they've had some uh, concerns about liability in her communities. Most states, most states have good Samaritan laws that will protect folks from this. Um, the liability concerns are often um, don't have um, good things to support why you would like. If you can give Narcan to somebody um, who isn't in an overdose, it will have no effect on them. Um, right. So the only thing that you can really do is it will help somebody who um, is experiencing an overdose of an opioid um, and reverse the respiratory arrest that would cause a death. Um, and so your state should have some good Samaritan laws where that's covered. There are certain nursing practices um, that uh, might be 
um, where nurses' um, practice rules forbid them from giving a, med a prescription medication to um, a patient whose name's not on the uh, prescription. Um, and many states have um, sort of given waivers to nurses to be able to do that. Um, but that was the only obstacle that we found for anybody in the state of New York, um, particularly with school nurses, uh, being able to have uh, naltrexone on hand to give uh, Narcan on hand to give to somebody who overdosed. Okay, um, we have a question also about paying for MAT. If a drug court participant cannot afford to pay for MAT, is the drug court responsible for covering the cost? Um, the person asking the question said the issue has come up in the public defender's office and not all drug courts have access to that kind of funding. So I don't know that anybody would say that a drug court is required to come up with the with the payment. If they don't have the money, they don't have the money. And, and any appellate cases that have looked at this have basically said that, you know, cost is legitimate in terms of, you know, not being able to provide services. But the, the real key here is that drug courts really need to do everything they can to figure out ways of finding coverage because, as was mentioned earlier, like many drug courts have been able to negotiate uh, uh, you know, low low payments or even in some respects no payments for some of these medications through the pharmaceutical companies. They've been able to uh, work with uh, uh, federally qualified health centers, with with uh, centers that are covered by the 340B program. So uh, just because the person themselves doesn't have insurance co co uh, coverage doesn't mean that you can't get the, the uh, medications covered. But no, we're not going to require a drug court to pay for something that they can't pay for. Right, and that could include um, having insurance navigators if you have uh, insurance availability in your state that would cover this. Insurance navigators can help folks get hooked up and then they're available to um, get insurance coverage for the MAT. Yep. Okay, we had a question also about how to incorporate uh, peer mentors and coaches into drug court. I wondered if um, one or all of you would want to take that question. I could start. Um, I have them on my team, so they're in staffing, in court, available. I consider it one of the essential pieces of what I what I do. Um, the in Minnesota, there, and I think maybe Steve mentioned it. There's more availability for billing and um, reimbursement for peer recovery, peer support services. So we're doing that uh, to the extent we can. And we are also providing, um, uh, we're getting funding to do free training to uh, get people through what in Minnesota is a 40-hour certification program to become peer recovery specialists. Um, I think they are critical, critical supports for what we're doing. But you got to invite them in. you got to build a relationship. you got to uh, get them coming, get them connected. And usually okay. they're very willing to come in. Right. Okay. Yeah. So um, we have a question of um, could treatment court case managers have any involvement in implementing the MAT or is this solely up to the judges, clinicians, and probation and parole officers? I think the question would be what, what do they mean by implementation? The choice of a medication um, through state law is between the physician um, or the physician extender and the patient. So making a determination on which medication to use, um, what the dosage is, et cetera, is all within the medical field. And um, the role of the court, including the judge, the case manager, um, both the prosecutor and defense, um, is to be supportive of the person's effort to get into uh, the medication program um, and then just as you know, like Doug mentioned before, the risk of um, you know, unless your jail can continue medication while somebody's getting um, like sanctioned, um, you, you basically want to slap their wrist for something, um, but you don't want to put them at a risk for a big overdose. So um, the notion of being able to use jail san sanctions carefully, um, particularly if they don't have access to their medication while they're incarcerated. 
Okay, we have, um, I'm going to read one more question and then we will make just for everyone who's still on the call and if your question wasn't um, answered or you had some additional follow-up information, we'll make every effort of doing a Q&A um, document to respond to the questions that were left unanswered, which will include with the, um, the slides and other information to everyone who's registered. So the last question um, I'd like to put out there is, um, what is an example of a higher magnitude sanction if someone is not complying with MAT requirements? I'm trying to understand what not complying would mean. Yeah. Uh, I think as we said earlier, earlier, you can't force, I mean, if, if a person is misusing the medication, if that's what's meant, that the person is, you know, has gotten a prescription they weren't supposed to get, or they uh, were not taking their medication, do they, you know, they're not testing positive for the medication that's supposed to be taken, or their pill count is short, then those are considered to be what we call proximal infractions. Those are, those are willful infractions. They're not a manifestation of their disorder. Then higher magnitude sanctions could include um, uh, day reporting requirements. They can include uh, home monitored curfew requirements. They could include uh, community service. They could include brief jail detention, you know, 24, 48-hour sanction if the person is engaged in, you know, uh, fraudulent activities with their, you know, especially diversion of the medications. So um, there's a whole list of uh, sanctions of varying ma uh, magnitudes that are listed. You can download them from NDCI's website. So they list them as sort of low, moderate, high for both rewards and sanctions. They give sort of examples of consequences that are, that are frequently used. I if like it means to the person. Points. Go ahead. Doug. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I like all those points. I would, my first questions would be um, more what is our treatment response? What's going on with this medication? What's happening? Um, are we, you know, are there, are there issues that we can take up in treatment around the medication usage and the adherence to the treatment um, that, that might answer your question too? I don't know that it, I'd be considering sanctions as well, but I'd firstly be asking what's going on here and, and what are what are what what can we do in a treatment milieu? Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, before we sign off for, from this webinar, I want to again thank all of our speakers for their both both their presentations and their responses to the questions. We have opened another poll with two questions about any kind of follow-up information that you believe would be helpful, and if you would respond, we would be grateful. Right now, you'll see on your screen that there are three, three documents that we have um, provided for you that you can download that, that specifically speak to the issues about medication-assisted treatment. Um, we also, um, the, the certificate of attendance can be downloaded at this time for your own portfolio. Again, if you signed on a few minutes into the webinar, this does not um, equate with CEU credits, but it's for your own personal portfolio. We also have, um, one of the questions had to do with mentors in court, and we have an upcoming webinar from the Gaines Center specifically with mentors in veterans treatment courts, but many of the strategies to engage mentors in treatment, um, veterans treatment courts would be the same as in drug treatment courts and other kinds of, of treatment courts. And we also have a listserv if you want to be um, given notice of webinars and other kinds of materials that are, that are released from the GAIN Center, you can sign up to the listserv here. And finally, here is the um, information from, the SAM, from SAMHSA, contact information and their website, as well as from the GAIN Center, which is co-hosting this webinar with SAMHSA today. So I want to thank everyone very much. If you could respond to the poll before you sign off, um, we'd be very appreciative. And I want to thank you very much for your participation.